Um, hi, everyone. On behalf of the IIP and the Center on Race, Law, and Justice at Fordham Law School, I want to thank you for joining our panel discussion on the law school's racial justice and prosecution. After this panel is over, we will post the full video as well as additional resources on the remote panel discussions page on our website, which will be linked in the chat. To stay up to date on all of our events, please follow us on all our socials um, at IIP underscore John Jay. We invite you to send questions throughout this panel. You can click the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send your question directly to the host. Now, at the IIP, we have adopted the practice of doing a living land acknowledgement before all of our events. This is specific to New York City, but we highly encourage all of our listeners to learn and acknowledge your local history wherever you may be. The IIP is based in New York City, which is Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude and acknowledge the genocide and continuous displacement of indigenous peoples. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built New York City during the colonial era and beyond. We acknowledge the harm inflicted upon the indigenous communities and people of color across the country, in particular, the ongoing and current harms to black communities, which inspires our ongoing work. Now, I will turn it over to today's moderator, Professor Bennett Capers, Director of the Center on, law, on Race, Law, and Justice at Fordham Law School. Thank you, Shauna Kay. And I'm so happy that the uh, Fordham Center on Race, Law, and Justice is uh, partnering with the uh, Institute for Innovation and Prosecution and putting together this program. And hopefully this will be the first of many collaborations between the two organizations. I'm also super excited about the panelists we have for this program. Um, I believe the audience members have access to their full bio, so I'm just going to introduce them with a sentence or two. Um, in no particular order, uh, I'll start with Blanche Cook, who is the Robert E. Harding Jr. Associate Professor of Law at University of Kentucky and uh, is a former federal prosecutor who specialized in large-scale drug cases, and sex trafficking prosecutions. Uh, next, Alifair Burke, professor of law at Hofstra Law School. Uh, she's a former deputy district attorney in Portland, Oregon. Um, she now works with prosecutors across the country to improve the quality of prosecutorial discretion. Um, can I add that um, Alifair Burke might be the only panelist with a Wikipedia entry. Um, in addition to being a law professor, she's also a best-selling crime novelist. I highly recommend her novels. Um, next, Audrey Moore, first assistant district attorney at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where her many roles include strengthening the office's diversity and inclusion. She was previously chief of the Special Victims Unit. And last, Renee Gregory, who's the chief diversity officer at the Brooklyn DA's office where she has served in various roles for over 20 years and has prosecuted an array of cases. Um, I will also mention, uh, just because I happen to notice this, uh, that she's a graduate of Brooklyn Law School, where I, where I used to teach before coming to Fordham Law School. So let's jump right into questions. Um, obviously, this panel is about law schools, racial justice and prosecution. Um, I have a lot of questions about those topics, but can I start by asking each of you a personal question? Why did you become a prosecutor? Um, and if you want to combine that with, you know, anything you say to young lawyers thinking about becoming prosecutors, feel free to add that. But I'm really curious, why did you become a prosecutor? Um, I guess I'll just start with Audrey. <laughs> So I, I will say that I wasn't one of those people who thought I always wanted to be in pro a prosecutor. And in fact, my interest throughout law school was employment discrimination in the law. And then I woke up my third year and said, I don't want to do that. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? I need a job. I like to argue. And I always had a feeling for what I thought were fighting justices, injustices. So I said, I'll become a prosecutor for five years. Um, and then I will go work for now or the, um, you know, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, because I really wanted to do big policy change and change the world. And I wasn't sure I would be able to do it there. Um, and I also just thought, you know, there needed to be more prosecutors who looked like me. So back when I started in 1989, the district attorney's office was really being attacked around the city for the lack of diversity in prosecution. 
fast forward that argument that, you know, that problem still hasn't really changed much. And I kind of thought there were two ways you change a system that's flawed. Um, and I thought the criminal justice system was you're either, you know, you need the people who are working externally, but you also needed people to work internally. And I thought that, you know, you bring your point of view, um, you know, what you're doing on your cases, you're doing what's, you know, what is right and what is just. And just bringing my diversity of experiences was hopefully going to help other people in terms of how they were looking and assessing people. Um, so that's the long and short of it. Okay. And what and what was the second question? What would you say to people? Yeah, if you want to add like what you said. You got to be a prosecutor. We need good people being prosecutors. When mm -hmm. people say to people, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, you. these are your friends. These are the people that you like. These are the people that you trust their judgment. Those are the people that you want to be prosecutors, you know? So it is so important that we stay committed to that because if you have all the good people or the people who you trust their judgment and you think they have good discretion and you think they're fair, if we don't be, if we're not in the field, it's left. Okay. And that scares me. Okay. Uh, Blanche, how about you? So I'm going to answer the easier question first, and that is why I became a prosecutor, and then answer what I say to people who are interested in becoming a prosecutor. Um, when I made the decision to become a prosecutor, it was largely naive and somewhat myopic. Um, at the time, my decision to become a prosecutor was really driven by professional advancement. Uh, at the time I'd become a, professor, uh, a prosecutor, I had been practicing law for about 15 years and calling myself a litigator, but I never actually tried a case. Uh, so there was interest on my part in gaining litigation skills and trial skills. And I knew those skills were invaluable. They were invaluable if I wanted to go back to a law firm and litigate again. If I wanted to become a professor, I actually had hands-on experience trying cases. The other thing that led me to uh, the US Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice is I took a measurement and a sort of survey of my cohorts who uh, had graduated from law school with me. And my friends that were at law firms were really well paid but had poor quality of life. They were always at the firm. The friends that I had that were at general counsel's offices were really well paid uh, but were feeling a, a lack of sort of intellectual challenge. The friends that I had that were prosecutors were striking a great balance between quality of life, salary, and also intellectual challenge. So that's what led me to make the decision. When I say that my decision was somewhat myopic and naive, I, don't, I did not understand exactly what a prosecutor was when I made the decision to become a prosecutor. So what I would advise young people, law school students, is to make sure you're aware of what you're getting into. Briefly, I call this power, preparation, and prudence. Uh, the first thing you need to understand about prosecutors is they wield a tremendous amount of power. Uh, under Title uh, 28, Section 547, you will find that federal prosecutors are actually the highest form of law enforcement. And what I want you to understand is prosecutors, whether they're county prosecutors, state prosecutors, federal prosecutors, are a part of law enforcement. They are one of the highest forms of law enforcement and they make up the same side of the adversarial wall within the criminal legal process. And here I'm borrowing from Paul Butler who does not call this the criminal justice system because in a number of cases, uh, there is an absence of justice. But in the criminal legal process, Prosecutors form a part of the same adversarial wall. So you'll often hear prosecutors calling federal agents and sheriffs and police officers brother, 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 brother. That was rampant in my office. They didn't call me brother. And I'll leave that to your imagination as to why. But, but it is a part of a fraternity, a kind of family. And as I stated, prosecutors wield a tremendous amount of power. They are actually policymakers. They make a decision about whether to pursue white collar crimes or drug crimes. That is very much a policy decision. For those of you who are familiar with the Ashcroft memo, uh, the Afro Ashcroft memo went out to federal prosecutors and charged them, uh, said that they had a duty to charge and pursue the most serious readily provable offenses. 
That is, that is policy. They also interpret the law, right? There's interpretations of law that, pos that prosecutors make. Prosecutors make a decision about whether there's going to be a case, whether there's going to be a victim, whether there are going to be any charges, how many charges there are going to be, if it's going to be one charge or 137 charges. And what they charge in the charging instrument sets the tone for the rest of the case. The decisions the prosecutors make about the charges is going to define what the sentencing will be at sentencing. What the prosecutor decides to charge is going to set the tone for the plea bargaining. Prosecutors make a decision about whether to offer bail or not to offer bail. They make decisions about whether that Brady material is going to be shared up front or closer to trial, which is going to implicate and affect the plea bargaining and the quality of the litigants within the plea bargaining process. And of course, prosecutors will make a decision about whether you have cooperated in your own prosecution, whether your, pro whether your cooperation meets the standards. And as a result, you'll get a reduction in your sentence. And of course, prosecutors make a decision about sentencing. And if you look at the prosecute, Bob Mueller in St. Louis, who made a decision about Michael Brown, Kim Gardner, who is the prosecutor that made some decisions about prosecuting the couple that decided to defend their home with firearms as the Black Lives Matter protesters were walking in the street in front of their house. Daniel Cameron, where I am in Kentucky, announced the Breonna Taylor uh, lack of a true bill. Those are people with a tremendous amount of power, and we can't possibly accept the argument that people of color can't occupy these positions of power, that in fact, we need to leave that to the majority. There's no way we can accept that argument on its face or in any way. Uh, very quickly, with respect to preparation, before you decide to become a prosecutor, before you decide to become a defense attorney, and just as part of your legal education, educate yourself. Read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Read Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. Paul Butler wrote um, Chokehold, but he also wrote um, Let's Get Free before that. Angela Davis at American has written a series of books and articles about being a prosecutor. And once you educate yourself, prepare a philosophy and be prepared to materialize it on the first day. You can actually be a progressive prosecutor, but like any predominantly white institution, you've got to be prepared to navigate those waters strategically, but prepare yourself ahead of time, get a philosophy, and a little later we can discuss uh, going into these offices en masse, but, but that's it for now. Great, great. Um, I, I want to comment, but I will just instead turn to Al up there. Um, <laughs> why did you become a prosecutor? And, uh, you know, what would I you think, say um, to a student? I think like Blanche, I, I entered it for kind of thin reasons. Like they, they were very much career focused. I was a very young, I was t 24, I think, when I got out of law school. Um, and I thought, it was highly likely I would want to be a law professor and the idea of being a law professor at 24 till I was 85 <laughs> seemed <laughs> kind of like a thin resume. And I thought, you know, I've got a few years, I could actually get some real experience before I, you know, become a professor and sit in my office all day and write articles. So being, I was very interested in criminal law during my judicial clerkship. I found myself really drawn to those cases. I'm like, well, these are interesting cases. It's a practice area that will help me be faster on my feet. You know, I was kind of a book smart lawyer, but had never tried a case. I'm like, this is a, a way for me to try a lot of cases in a few years to really see what the criminal justice system looks like, um, not just from a book, you know, before I go into the academy. And I entered it, I think really, like Blanche said, not knowing realistically what the daily life of a prosecutor was gonna look like. I thought it was gonna be like law and order. And I was going to be trying cases every day where you're really like hurry up and waiting a lot of the times and you're issuing cases and you're doing plea bargains and you're cranking out indictments in grand jury rooms. And it's like, oh, this is not what I thought I was going to be doing at all. Um, but I became very fascinated by that aspect of the job that it, it's not the times you're actually in court saying objection and hearsay that are actually the most interesting days. It's the behind the scenes work. Um, 
it's the policy decisions. Like I, I, wound up, I spent about half of my time at the DA's office um, prosecuting domestic violence cases. That's where I got a ton of um, uh, trial experience. But then I also worked as a com community-based prosecutor um, out of a police precinct. And that involved much more um, trying to find alternatives to prosecution, developing diversion programs, um, really more of the institutional work of, you know, what do we do with entire streams of cases? And I became really interested in all of that stuff, um, not just the trying cases work. And, you know, 20 something years later, I'm still writing about that, you know, the, the culture um, and discretionary decisions that prosecutors make um, outside of the courtroom. Um, in terms of what I would advise students, I mean, hopefully that's what we're going to be talking about most of the time. But, um, you know, if I had to pick one thing, I think similar to what um, Blanche and Audrey were saying is, um, you know, be thoughtful about it. You know, know more about it than I did, certainly, um, before making that decision and know why you're becoming a prosecutor. You know, you might change your mind while you're there. I know plenty of people entered a DA's office thinking they were going to be lifers and they wound up being the people who took their trial experience and went elsewhere. I know other people who thought they were going to go and get a few years of trial experience and they become lifers and become the people who create policy and, and run the office um, for generations to come. So, but at least in terms of going into it, you know, have some idea of why you're there and how long you expect to be there and what your goals are, because that might affect um, the decisions you make while you're there, right? If, if you know you're only there to get trial experience for your own career advancement, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it might make you more willing, you know, to to put your neck out, right? If you're not somebody who's trying um, to, to stay there um, and run the office someday, right? Um, it might make you more willing to rock the boat. If you are there hoping to become a career person who's able to really make policy, you might handle yourself differently, right? So kind of know your goals going in. And I also advise students, you know, regardless of what area of the law they wanna enter, um, you know, take every opportunity you can to talk to lawyers about their work, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, what their jobs actually are day to day. You know, I'll talk to students who find criminal law cases kind of sexy and interesting and the facts are cool. But then when you explain to them what you're actually going to be doing day in and day out, they're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to do that. So um, whereas, you know, tax law might sound really dry, but the, you might have the personality of a tax lawyer, you know, so um, take those opportunities to really talk to people about what the work looks like. Thank you. And how about you, Renee? So my, my path was a little bit uh, different. Uh, when I graduated from college, I graduated with a degree in education and I became a teacher. But one of the things that happened uh, when, when I was teaching is that my service to the young people and to the community that I taught in, I taught in East New York and in Bedford-Stuyvesant, didn't just end at three o'clock when the when the day was over. You know, I, I, I visited homes and I, and I worked, helped parents to make sure that their young people received the services that they should. So my, my point to that is that I was always very uh, public service community minded. So when I started uh, law school, uh, I did not know what I what I wanted to do, and in fact, thought that I might just take my law degree, go back uh, into the classroom, and really be a stronger advocate uh, for for young people to to uh, get what they were entitled to. And after several internships, I interned in my last year at the um, Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. And the first day of internship, they take you to arraignments. And uh, we were in arraignments. It was noisy, dirty. People were unhappy. They were cursing and there was yelling and so on. And I thought to myself, wow, this is just like the school cafeteria. I think this is, um, this is the place for me where I could continue to serve the community and and um, and help people who were coming into the office, not just with the fact that they may have been a victim or victimized, but and beyond, you know. So so what is it that we in the office uh, can can do for you? I would say to anyone that's considering uh, to be a prosecutor, number one, you have to like people. 
Because if you don't like people, you know, the, the, the dozens, hundreds of stories that are going to come before you are, are, are going to wear you down. And then you're not going to really be listening, paying attention to what both the victim and the accused um, need. And that, that's important. You know, I, I, I always worry, particularly when I uh, got into the supervisory level and started interviewing for potential assistant district attorneys, you know, when when folks would say, I, I want to try cases and that, you know, make no mistake that that's part of it. But it always concerned me. Will that be at um, will you step over victims? and the accused to try cases and, and ignoring a really re reviewing the case, determining what's best, you know, with your victim, not for your victim, but de determining what's best and, and what is best for Brooklyn, for the community in terms of the person who was ac accused, you know, because the ultimate goal is that we don't want this to happen anymore and we, we still want... Um, Brooklyn to be safe. So um, that's the long and short of it. Um, and that's how I ended up at the uh, Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Thank you. So I, I actually want to build on something you said, Renee, because um, you said when you were, uh, I think, an intern, you were taken to arraignments and you're like, okay, this is what I want to do. I have heard something sobering about arraignments, uh, like and I don't know if this is true for Portland, I don't know if it's true for Nashville, I don't know if it's true for Manhattan, but I've heard like, you know, when law students go to things like arraignment, it's like you see just black people and brown people as defendants and it can be very depressing. And against that, you sort of have like, you know, prosecutors who are mostly not black or not right. brown, um, probably the same is true for judges, which sort of leads me to the next question. like what's it like being a minority, a person of color as a prosecutor, um, and especially sort of, you know, in a jurisdiction where a lot of the people you're prosecuting look like you, whereas most of your colleagues don't. You know, probably most of the people look, look like me. Um, out of that experience of interning and, and going in and out of uh, arraignments and other court parts, what, what I realized is that um, the court system and, and the community needed someone like me. I don't want to say me, but needed someone like me. Because, you know, I, I think what happens is that the system moves along and everyone assumes that everyone knows what's going on. And even when I was interning, so I'm, I'm, and I say that to say I knew nothing, right, but I was interning, I, there would be people who had just stood before the judge with their attorney, you know, the prosecutor on the other side, and it, when they stepped outside in the hall, I mean, they didn't care who I was. They were asking me 20 questions, which made me kind of realize we're not serving anyone well if the, the person who has the most at stake here is making decisions or not making decisions, not understanding what the you know what the whole process is about. It's difficult. I mean, I'm not in the courts now, but it was difficult to walk into the courtroom, and everyone assumed you were the, you were the defendant's mother. You know, um, I tried a case one time. The case went on five, six, seven days. And when they paged us, that's how long ago it was, to come back to the courtroom because the jury had a, a verdict. I came in with the big court file and I came into the courtroom and the clerk who had been in there every day, every day for trial said, oh, they're bringing your son out the back. They have a, a verdict. And, and that, you know, not that that was my first time realizing that, but it made me realize you're not looking, you're not paying attention. How can you even do the best for the system, right? And for the people, if you're not paying attention? It was frustrating going in and that front bench was for attorneys and I would sit on that front bench and the judge would yell, that bench is for attorneys. 
you know, there, there, there were, there are, and I'm hope I'm thinking it's a little better, but there, but there are frustrations that you, as a, as an, a prosecutor, uh, have to deal with, and you know that you shouldn't have to make that fight, you know. So, it's it's tough. What I found um, is that I continue to develop my my service and on an outside life, you know, so that my my only focus wasn't just all of these black and brown people. Um, in court, so I'm active. I'm a Girl Scout leader, you know, working and mentoring uh, young ladies. Uh, you know, I, I work in, with different community-based organizations. So that gave me some sort of balance, so that the only thing that I was experiencing it wasn't the only thing that I was experiencing um, the black and brown people who were in court. But you know what? I live in Bedford Stuyvesant. I saw a lot of those people in the supermarket, in the fish market, you know, on the street. They would they would ask questions. So I once again felt like, okay, I'm 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 being I'm serving them. You know, they're they're they and they knew they knew I was a prosecutor. You know, they miss miss. I know I'm not supposed to talk to you, but I have a question. So. Um, you have to find balance. It, you just can't um, do the work and not uh, engage in other positive activities. So I should I should say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure lots of us probably have similar stories. And unfortunately, it's probably true of just being a lawyer, regardless of what kind of law you're practicing, where people make those kind of mistakes and assumptions. But the other thing I want to say is, um, you know, I should have said this earlier to the panelists, feel free to chime in at any point, feel free to like, you know, if you want to weigh in on something Renee has said or something I have said or whatever, feel free. And also I'm going to remind the audience, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are going to take questions from you, just put them in the Q&A function because um, we actually love audience questions. So just a reminder to use the Q&A function. Anybody else want to weigh in on what to sort of like being a minority or a person of color, prosecutor, um, especially, I mean, g given the yeah. demographics of, of who's often prosecuted. I mean, I think it's very, um, I, I think it's hard when I first started. Unfortunately, we all have the experience. I went and over and stood, you know, into the well and stood where the ADA stands, you know, looking at the files. And, you know, you have someone come over and says, what are you doing over there? This is for the ADA. And this you know, you learn grace, right? Because I would, and I just turned, I remember to the court officer and I said, and why wouldn't you think I'm the ADA? Because, you know, you kind of put it back on them. And, you know, we've had ADAs who have been cursed at. Um, you know, we've had, you can get it sometimes from people like you, Uncle Tom, um, you know, when you're, you know, you're, you know, when you're at arraignments. Um, I've always, it, it really is, my father is a retired New York City detective and he kind of was like, are you sure you want to do this? Because you're going to the foundation of the criminal justice system is a racist system. Um, I thought he prepared me well in a sense for the fight. But when you walk into a courtroom the first time, you know, you, I don't think you'll ever forget that moment where you're sitting there and it's like, as you say, it's black person after black person. And that you're like, thank God I'm here. Like, thank God, you know, this person is usually a white person. You know, thank God you're sitting in that space. But I just say to fast forward a little bit to what has been going on in this world, you know, and I now have children. I always tell people when I'm sitting in space and as we're even looking at stuff, I'm thinking about my community. And I'm also thinking about, I have two, tall, young black men, 6'4 and 6'5. And, and that's somewhat of my lens. And at a certain point, I will be honest with the, the panel, everybody, I question whether or not I should be a prosecutor, you know, at this point in time with everything that was going on. And I think, um, you know, Renee talked about it. Part of it is having, you got to have a great tribe. You have to have a great support system um, that supports you. 
And so for many of us who've been doing this, you know, for a minute, you know, I'm a senior executive. I'm allowed, you know, I can say things that maybe other people don't feel empowered to say. Um, I can never forget that I am black because the minute I walk out of one place, nobody sees ADA Audrey Moore, they see a black person. And I always take that with me. But I will say it, it's hard dealing with the tension um, and you have to, what's good about some of what has gone on over the past years is we no longer, I think more people are just much more aware that you cannot say you're not aware of the in in inequities and the racial disparity that exists because people are seeing it now um, and we're having conversations about it that I'm not sure I would have thought we would have had in a DA's office. I think it's, it's forcing officers offices to really kind of step up because if we're gonna have criminal justice reform, I think as it's talked about, we have discretion, we have the power. It's, it's all who's sitting in these offices. But the tension is real for us. And I would never want someone coming into this space. You know what I tell people? And, and it's not that I think everybody belongs in jail because we have gone through alternatives to incarceration. You have to really think about whether or not you can recommend that someone be incarcerated. And you, and, and you have to think about that. And it's, it's seriousness because it's not something I take lightly. You know, they used to take us to Rikers Island when we started. And I think that was one of the best things to do. Because, you know, Rikers is just this place that exists. But when you are physically in this place and you hear those doors close, you know, it becomes very real in terms of what we are doing when we're recommending bail or jail sentences. Uh, so it's just like right now, I think it's harder to be a prosecutor, um, but I also think we have more allies to really make change. And Alifa, you look like you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I mean, it's actually painful. I didn't hear Audrey saying like there are still days that she questions it. Um, it and Bennett, you said at one point, um, you know, when Renee was saying, you know, we're going and getting your son now, and you know, Audrey being asked, you know, that's that's for the ADA's table. Um, and you said, well, to some extent, it's just even lawyering. But I do think there's something specific about a prosecutor's office and. One of the things I've noticed is, and maybe this is changing, but at least back in my day um, and not that long ago, hiring at DA's offices, it's like there's a type. It's like central casting that they have in mind what a prosecutor looks like, what their resume looks like, how they talk. You know, it's this idea of what the prosecutor looks like you know look at you know any tv show you could be like yeah oh, that's the prosecutor looking in the courtroom and it, and if they continue to hire like that i mean even fairly recently you know my students would come to me and say i don't know what to do i think i want to be a prosecutor but i might want to be a defense attorney and you know the rational thing to do is they're law students you know use your internships do an internship at one place and the other get to know the offices see what you know, what your jam is. And instead, there were prosecutors' offices that if they found out that a student was willing to do defense work, it was a strike against them. Like, you're not one of us. If you were even willing to entertain, you know, being a defense attorney, that shows me that you don't have the mindset, the mindset of a prosecutor, like this kind of warrior-like attitude. Um, and I think until that changes, you're going to have this kind of self-fulfilling um, winnowing out of certain voices and you're not going to have representation in the office and you're not going to have a diversity of viewpoints. You're not going to have that important listening function that Renee was talking about um, where you see people as actual human beings where you register like Audrey was saying the there's a real toll <laughs> you're taking a human being and incarcerating them and are you stopping and thinking about the impact of that if if to even have those thoughts is disqualifying because you don't have the warrior attitude. Um, and so I hope that is something that when prosecutors are, you know, everybody running for office saying that they're a, a new kind of prosecutor, a progressive kind of po prosecutor, I think that involves looking at how they hire people. Um, that maybe it's not always good that you start everybody from scratch. Like, you know, Renee 
before we turned on the Zoom was saying, you know, even though she was had had 16 years of experience as a teacher, which teaches you a lot, um, you start from the bottom. I mean, that's how all prosecutors' offices do that, and you sort of get indoctrinated um, in those first few years. And I think it keeps people um, maybe from the culture from changing as quickly as you might want it to change right now during these times. Um, and I also think, you know, power in numbers. I think Audrey, you mentioned that. Like there, there needs to be a critical mass. Um, if you've only got a few faces that you use as faces, at least, you know, where I was a prosecutor, I mean, doubly so Portland, Oregon, like there's just no diversity in the bar at all, um, but particularly at the at the DA's office. And the few people, and, and this was true for women, like you'd see women in the office, but they were doing child support enforcement. They were doing domestic violence work. They were doing the you know child victims. It was kind of like the, the mommy the mom, mommy cases. And then, um, you know, the meat and potato stuff were the guys who look like central casting and the few faces of color they tended to put in community roles or speaking roles, kind of out facing um, jobs that are kind of outside the career track you know, of, of who's really running the office. So, you know, I think students should be mindful of that and ask those questions um, as they decide where to go and if they want to go at all. Lance? So uh, really quickly, and of course, when any lawyer starts something off saying really quickly, they know they're going to take a bit of time, but I'm going to try to make this quick. Um, Especially a law professor. <laughs> now a law professor, exactly. Double trouble. Um, but for not just minority students, but for every student, as you're trying to navigate your career and figure out what you want to do, you want to ask as many people who do what you want to do, what they do, so that you can make some sort of decision about whether this is truly something you want. What does your day-to-day -day existence look like? What do you spend the majority of your time doing? Are you happy doing what you're doing? And both Audrey and Renee and, 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 and Alifar were, were dead on. You, you've got to ask that meta-ethical question about whether you can put someone in prison. Now, decades ago, when I had to confront that question, it was some of the best advice I got about whether I wanted to be a prosecutor. Another prosecutor said, are you going to be comfortable putting somebody in prison? And I said, well, if they've got to go to prison, they need to go to prison. I can do it, right? But, and my thought was, if the person is guilty of the crime, they're going to prison whether I'm going to be there or I'm not going to be there. And perhaps what I can do, Paul Butler makes this uh, argument about being the undercover brother. Perhaps I can uh, instigate change within the office. Perhaps I can recommend diversion. Perhaps I can recommend another sentence or a lower sentence. Um, part of my awakening as a prosecutor came in 2007 when we had a global recession because we had the societal consensus about who criminals were, what they looked like, and what criminal activity looked like. So there was this massive war on drugs. There was a lot of rhetoric about putting black and brown people in prison under the auspices of drug dealing. But when we had the global recession that was largely caused by unregulated banking practices, I didn't see the societal thirst for putting Wall Street bankers in prison to the tune of drug dealing. Right? We lacked a societal consensus about what criminal activity is, who engages in criminal activity, and who should be in prison. And in fact, as a result of the global recession, if I'm not mistaken, there's only been a handful of prosecutions related to those cases, and less than a handful of people who actually did prison time. So it was at that point that I really needed to reckon with what it meant to be guilty. What were we defining as crime and who were we criminalizing as a result? Um, I had been largely doing drug cases and gun cases up to that point. I read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. That's a story for another day as well. But it was at that time that I decided to start prosecuting other cases. So we spent a lot of time talking about overcriminalization. There's a lot of cases that are undercriminalized, not the least of which are sexualized violence cases rape cases, sexual assault cases, sex trafficking cases. Those are cases that go under prosecuted, right? So it was at that time that I started focusing my energy on civil rights cases, hate crime cases, and sex trafficking cases. So as you're making a decision about what you wanna do, understand the breadth 
of criminal prosecutions and what's available for you there. Um, in terms of, uh, one of the things you wanna know as well is why are you being hired, right? So I, I'm sometimes hired to be the face of racist treachery, right? I'm sometimes hired to take the sting of a racist critique out of the institution or the office in order for people in the office to say, oh, look at the Negro, right? Oh, look at the person of color. We can't possibly be such a racist institution or a, a racist office when we have black people who are actually here. So we've gotta be real careful about whether we're used as people of color to legitimate the politics of the office. I completely agree with everything that's been said before me. You know, part of the problem with the criminal process system, people want to oversimplify the problem of white supremacy, honorary whiteness and dishonorary blackness, the problem of racism. So we want to locate the problem in the police and critique the police. We want to locate the problem in the prosecutors and critique prosecutors. We're dealing with a ubiquitous problem. White supremacy is everywhere. And I do mean everywhere without being hyperbolic. Nursery school, kindergarten, grade school, high school, colleges, universities. So what you're dealing with is a ubiquitous problem. And it's gonna take ubiquitous resolve and ubiquitous reformations in order to fix this problem. It is not just an issue of the criminal legal process, prosecutors or police. You're dealing with a huge problem. And the way it gets materialized is in some ways, we are trying to regulate poverty through the criminal legal process. And part of what I advocate for is a better supported society. If we had a better supported society, we would have a lot less crime. We would have a lot less violent crime. We would, we would have a lot less desperate socioeconomic crimes. If we had guaranteed housing where people could live with dignity, like countries in Scandinavia, if we had guaranteed health care and it was good health care, if we had better quality education so that people are entering the wor world with better opportunities, if we had guaranteed wages, right? If we had a better supported society, we would have less victims and less crimes. But those are difficult conversations to have. It's much easier to just critique prosecutors or just critique police. And that's not to say that we're not worthy of critique, but we don't need to oversimplify this problem because in doing so, we simply reify the problem. Um, in terms of being a minority in, uh, or a person of color in a, a US attorney's office or as a prosecutor, for most of us in our professional careers, we are going to be in predominantly white institutions, right? As law school professors, we're still in predominantly white institutions. As prosecutors, you will be in predominantly white institutions. And it's not as if the defense attorney's office is a panacea. Let's be real clear about that. Because that George Floyd trial, those racist arguments that are being made are being made by defense attorneys, right? So I, I call this uh, the walking dead, right? Black people, we, we don't get murdered, we don't get killed. We collapse from diabetes, we collapse from our drug addictions, uh, we collapse from all sorts of things and not uh, someone kneeling on our neck for nine minutes right? That there's something so inherently pathological about us that we could die at any point in time and then be responsible for our own deaths. That Derek Chauvin is somehow distracted from the murder of George Floyd because he's surrounded by Black angry people. See, those are defense attorneys who are making those arguments. And they're making those arguments to people for whom those arguments will resonate. There are people, the court of public opinion, the jurors, the judge, people who are involved in this will listen to those arguments and those arguments resonate for them. So we've got to be real clear about everything that we're dealing with, with respect to this problem. And prosecutors can actually make a difference really quickly. And I said that at the outset, probably five minutes ago, but this really will be quick. There are progressive prosecutors who are making a difference. There are black women out there who are making a difference. And do you know how we know that? Because there's a lot of forces trying to get rid of them. See, if you were insignificant and you didn't make any difference at all, people would leave you alone, right? 
If there's a mosquito outside, I'm not going out there with a semi-automatic weapon. I'm simply not going to do that. But the Kim Foxes of the world, the Marilyn Mosby's of the world, uh, the Kim Gardner, who is the St. Louis uh, 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 circuit attorney, uh, they're getting resistance. They're getting hate mail. Uh, they're getting death threats. They're, the, the police unions and the prison guard unions are fighting against them because they are making a difference. They are making change. Early on, Renee talked about victim-centered approaches. You can make those decisions as a prosecutor. You can have that kind of impact Last two things, Harvard Law, uh, Harvard Law put out a really interesting article about the paradox of progressive prosecutors. If you're dealing with the meta-ethical dilemma of putting a whole lot of black and brown people in prison and whether you can do that, I, I hasten you to read that. And also there is a group called Fair and Just Prosecution. Uh, they are devoted to progressive prosecutions. They have a 21 point plan uh, in terms of how you can make a difference in a prosecutor's office. Um, and I think that probably shouldn't be enough for me for the time. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I had, when you were talking, wrote down just before you said it about education, health, and, and so on. That all has to be part of the conversation. But I wanted to also call to uh, the attention of uh, law students and, and others who, are, who have joined us today is that when you said the word diversion, Blanche, that was not part of the language when I started in the district attorney's office. If you even dare thought of diversion, if, if, if you didn't use the word, you were called out. You don't want to try cases. You don't, you know, you just, you just don't, you don't, you don't want to hold people accountable. So uh, students, law students who are considering coming to district attorney's offices now need to know that in many of them, like Brooklyn and, and um, Manhattan as well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for you, Audrey, um, we, uh, diversion is part of our language now, and I think that that makes a, a big difference than when I started 23 years ago and Audrey, you, you started before that. It was a no-no to say that word. And I also want to say a big wake up call came for me when I was when I was a felony assistant and it was a case with a trunk load full of marijuana, right? So that rose to the level of a felony. The person arrested um, was white and Jewish. And when I called the defense attorney to talk about this non-jail offer, right? The defense attorney said to me, oh, no, 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 Renee, you're, you're, you're confused. My client is white. That's not an offer for him. And I said, whoa, okay, whoa. I mean, really just kind of, whoa. And I think um, that really woke me up. If, I, if I, I knew before that there were two systems that, that were operating, but that like gave me a good knock on the head to say, I'm, I'm trying my best here with uh, people who are accused and, and are of color, but there's a whole nother system, a whole nother type of action going out there. So um, just wanted to, to bring that point up. So I, know, I know the other panelists probably want to chime in again, but I just have to say, um, Blanche, I'm glad you brought up the, the Derek Chauvin trial. Renee, I'm glad you went back to diversions because one thing I don't want to get lost is uh, right now prosecutors are showing up and they are doing some good things, um, you know, and I'm glad you talked about progressive prosecutors and I'm glad you talked about the different types of cases that you can get involved in. So if you don't want to do X type of cases, you could do the type of cases you want to do that's all fine and good. But I do have, before I, there are lots of good audience questions, but before I get to those audience questions, um, especially for Renee and Audrey, like, can you just talk about what your offices are doing better now than they might've been doing 10 years ago in terms of diversity and inclusion and racial justice? Well, I think we exist right now. You know, DA's office is having chief diversity. What? That would have never been something um, that exist, and we're actually part of a cohort of other chief diversity officers from um, other 
DA's offices to kind of support each other. Um, for us, I know when um, our DA, when DA Vance was running, he said, I'm going to let Vera come in and look at our data and figure out if there's racial disparity. You know, and I know many people were like, is he crazy to say you're going to open up, you know, and, and you do that. And if you don't look to see where your problems are, then you won't find them. And sometimes you, be, you have to be bold enough and courageous, courageous enough to really look to see where your problems are. So I will say that's, you know, something we've done. I mean, we have just thought about things very differently. And part of what we even did last year with um, the rookie started, you know, the DA sent them a letter talking about, you know, this racial reckoning and racial disparity. Um, they were all required to read Just Mercy and to watch the movie 13. And then we actually incorporated having some of our um, more senior ADAs talking about what does Just Mercy mean and what does it mean to be a good prosecutor and, you know, what are best practices and, you know, our training just looks so different and well. But I mean, to, just to think about it for a moment for an eight, you know, for a new a rookie, a new assistant to get a letter from the DA saying, this is part of what I, your grounding, your foundation needs to be. Our trainings look different. You know, Vera came in and did a training for the entire office um, called Motion for Justice. You should go on their website, has great materials as well. And, you know, really talking about mass incarceration, what we as prosecutors have done as it relates to mass incarceration. Because you also have to kind of have a connection from, you know, Jim Crow to how the, you know, Michelle Alexander's book, you, you know, you have to, you have to be, you be reading and being a lot more educated about how you're looking at stuff. I mean, we, you know, also have to realize that we need to listen to our communities. Like communities can talk to us and also tell us about like, what do they think we need to do differently in terms of what, you know, how they define safety. Um, because sometimes prosecutors get caught up in, you know, I think we are about public safety, but what does it mean to a community to be safe is not always necessarily over, over policing a community. And I just think there's much more kindness and grace in terms of even how we look at dispositions, alternatives to incarceration now, restorative justice understanding that if you want to change problems that exist in some communities, the communities have to be part of the solution. We can't sit there and say, we are best in terms of serving what this is. And I just want to, one of the points that I would just also like to make for law students, and I actually did this training at um, a few years back, and basically every DA's office is not the same and we're all not for each other like maybe my office is not as aggressive as other offices etc or my office is too liberal you need to figure out where you can go to do this job and you need to look at like what they're doing so like do they have any conviction integrity are they talking about alternatives to incarceration what does their training program look like here in the manhattan da's office we started a program uh-oh uh-oh. Renee, you want to jump in while we see if Audrey can come we can, up? We can get Audrey back from the twilight zone. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think what, what Audrey said at the, at the beginning uh, is that we're here. This position is here. There's an acknowledgement um, that it's needed and not just for dressing, but to, um, you know, for us to reach out um, into, into the world and let you know, communities know that we are interested in uh, representing the community with with diverse staff. Um, when DA Gonzalez uh, be became a district attorney, he launched the Justice 2020 initiative, uh, and he had um, people from uh, all, I hate to say all walks of life, all, all different community-based organizations, uh, the, the Defender Bar Associations, uh, community activists, and so on, to uh, meet, sit down, and come up with components that um, they thought um, or they believed would, would be advantageous towards 
a, a criminal justice reform. So it wasn't just, well, D.A. Gonzalez thinks, you know, he was, he was willing uh, to open up the office uh, to, to uh, many more people to, to hear what their opinions are. Because, you know, sometimes you may think you know what's best until you hear uh, what other people have to say. And as a result of that, um, we are now working on our Justice 2020 um, initiatives, which, which is, is, is very important to do. Um, I would say, what else has, what was your question? What else changed? Well, well, I will, I, I'm going to move on to my next question, but okay, I will just great. add, it's sort of nice to open up the New York Times and see that, you know, the Brooklyn District Attorney, Eric Gonzalez, is vacating lots of convictions because yes. he's concerned about the integrity of those convictions because a cop perjured himself. You know, so. Absolutely. And, and I think what's important about that is that it sends a message to the to the community that you know at the Brooklyn DA's office and and other offices that are that are doing similar things um, that we're not willing to just hi Audrey turn a blind <laughs> eye you know it could have been very easy for us to say yeah that guy he lied but the you know DA Gonzalez took it a step further and said okay let's look at the cases where there you know were convictions both misdemeanors and felonies and um, now uh, we cannot rely on, uh, you know, his testimony and, and his paperwork. I also want to say too, it, it's important um, for the district attorney to be out in the community, you know, so that uh, the community sees who that person is. Not, and not just the DA, but assistant district attorneys too going into uh, classrooms to talk to young people, you know, going to precinct council meetings, community board meetings and street fairs and so on. All of that is very important to, to and when I say the image, I don't mean a glossy image, but to, the, to, to how people, you know, perceive us. I mean, there's a difference when they come to the office and we're dressed in our lawyer suit, our lawyer clothes, as opposed to when we go to National Night Out or some other uh, big festival uh, in the community, and we, you know, are, are, are dressed casually and we're, you know, helping to give out ICs or, or, or whatever it is that we do, that's important. That that has um, changed um, uh, from 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 years ago. So, get it, letting the community get to know us and then you know what in the, in the same token we get to know them you know yeah. so if it's One okay with, I was oh i was just going to say if it's okay with john jay college and okay with the panelists i'm going to keep this going for at least another five minutes because um i find this fascinating and i think audience members find it fascinating and there's still some really great questions in the q a that i want to put to okay. people but alpha you are about to Chime in. I was going to echo what Renee was saying about the importance of um, being out into the community and um, it echoes what Blanche was saying about, um, you know, crime reduction and law enforcement isn't just prosecuting cases that goes to things like education and income inequality and all of that and I think, you know, when I was a community prosecute, community based prosecutor, I was going to all these meetings that normally like, they'd be like, why is a prosecutor here when we're talking about like elder care services at the county level? And you bring the power of your office, right? And you bring the voice of law enforcement, like that it gets attention in a way that maybe if, if the usual um, advocate for social services um, are actually being backed up by law enforcement saying, you know, we need more elder care services because they are being victimized both physically and financially. This is a law enforcement concern, right? We want to prevent the cases from happening in the first place. That that's a way um, for prosecutors to use their power um, outside of the courtroom and kind of expand what people see as a law enforcement function, that it's not just processing cases. Um, but as much as we've been talking about the power that prosecutors do have, I mean, I don't think we even kind of started to touch the surface about what they don't have. I mean, I think a lot of people think prosecutors sit above police, like there's some chain of command that overlaps 
and they do not. Um, in particular, if we're talking to a New York audience, the NYPD is all five boroughs, right? They're bigger than any single DA's office and they're the ones generating the cases. Um, and largely the case processing role that DA's have as a central function is reactionary, right? They can try to shape what the police do, but it's in a very indirect way. Uh, they can't give orders to the police. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. And it probably, you know, something to be mindful of. Cause I think yeah. some people just think, why, why can't prosecutors just tell the police not to do that? And it's like, oh no, 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 that's not how that works. So. Yeah, you remind me one of the controversies <laughs> recently was, you know, NYPD still arresting even though the prosecutors were like, we're not going to prosecute, the officers kept arresting. So we have, I, I know people, I, I know I'm keeping you over, but I just have to ask a few questions from the Q&A. And I'm going to actually begin with a comment um, from Judge Travis Richardson. I'm sure I'm not embarrassing him, but uh, he says, does Blanche know that she's amazing? So, so <laughs> I will just put that out there. And then from uh, Z, who happens to be one of my students, one of my favorite students, what is your response to the claim that as junior line prosecutors of color, uh, or, or as a junior line prosecutor of color who's progressive, that person does not possess the authority to bring about systemic change, and that that person is more likely to be co-opted by the white institution instead? Um, and this vein isn't reaching a critical mass, more a fantasy than a realistic goal. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to give a brief response to that. Um, I, I will say quickly to Travis, Judge Richardson, the check is in the mail. He's actually, uh, we went to law school together, so thank you so much for saying that. But um, there's a couple of things here. We've got to get away from this idea that only white people need to populate the prosecutor's offices for whatever reason. We can't have systemic change or just align. Here's the problem. Black communities, communities of color want to be safe just like anybody else. So where those decisions are being made about what safety is, we need to be sitting there. Let me give you an example. As a prosecutor, you will make a decision about what kinds of cases are being prosecuted. Let's just take the roofers, right? People who will come to your door, particularly in poor and vulnerable neighborhoods and say, uh, well, I'll build your roof and here's a lifetime guarantee it's $15,000. And then that person goes and changes their business so that it's a new business and you can't find them and you can never collect on the lifetime warranty. So you have those predatory practices in communities of color and you want someone who can say, you know what, we're going to prosecute those cases because that's part of safety as well. So where these decisions are made, you want to be. As a line prosecutor, are you engaged in overall systemic changes? Yes and no. You can make decisions about your cases, even as a line prosecutor, you can ask for a lesser sentence. You can ask for lesser charges. You can suggest to your supervisors that this is not a case that we should prosecute, but it is going to be navigating. You're gonna to have to build your professional reputation within your office and within law enforcement ranks, so people will respect the decisions that you're making. The judges will have to respect the work that you do. There's all of that respectability and proficiency politics that are involved, but you can have an impact as a line prosecutor in decisions that are being made. Really quickly, um, I prosecuted a woman uh, who was receiving packages in the mail. Um, and I caution everybody out there, do not receive packages in the mail for anybody. Uh, do not have people you don't know in your car, right? Because when that cocaine gets discovered, guess who it will be? But in any case, I had a, a situation with a young woman who was receiving packages in the mail. It was contraband. It was drugs. Um, she later um, went to law school and I lobbied for her to become a member of the bar. Now, Am I trying to put myself on a pedestal? No, I truly am not. But what I'm trying to make sure people understand is wherever you are, you can be effective. If you're in a law firm, you may just be a line associate, but you can be effective in that law firm. If, if, if you are a law school student, you may just be a law school student, but you can be effective 
wherever you are. And that is certainly true of prosec prosecutors' offices as well. So can I ask a follow-up question of everybody? Because um, the other question that keeps permeating, uh, permeating the Q&A is, well, how do we encourage more students of color to become prosecutors? How do we encourage more students who are committed to sort of racial justice and equity to become prosecutors? Um, what can law schools do to sort of like, you know, encourage or better prepare students of color or students committed to social justice to be prosecutors? Um, I know we only have like three minutes, but <laughs> they, need to they, need to, they need to see us and hear yeah. us. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Like we should, we should have these conversations. Like we're not afraid to have these conversations and to answer the hard questions. Right. Because I think what sometimes people really want to hear, like how do you, how do you get through the day to day, and particularly even from people who are junior to to Renee and I, of what that experience is. I mean, we we asked our um, interns every summer. We talked to our college interns. We talked to our legal interns of color. And we'll talk to them about how is the process, you know, part of it, we want to know what we can do better as an office. But you know what's very interesting about this? Many of them are saying they're not getting support from their schools. Like if you ask them, how did I learn about this program? It's not coming from the schools. Um, so I think that schools have to make sure that if you have students who are interested, you're supporting them. You're giving them the tools to be successful and how to interview at a prosecutor's office, how to get the job. And I just think it's something that we hear every year about how they don't feel supported at the institutions where they're, you know, where they're matriculating. And I think that's, you know, that's a problem. And, and, I, and you know, Renee's here, we have an organization, National Black Prosecutors. We really do try to put ourselves out there to say why, and we will talk about why Black people need to be prosecutors, the tension of being a Black prosecutor. I just think we have to start having these conversations in more spaces. And, you know, hey, we'll, we'll come and talk to your people. I was going to say, you're going to get an invitation from me. <laughs> I was going to say, Oscar, we'll talk. I was going to email you. You got it. Yeah, Audrey, I have to say, I just, I just learned two days ago that my school doesn't even have a criminal law society. So, you know, obviously we got work to do at Fordham Law School. Um, really? But, but we'll, um, we'll be there. We'll be there. You, sure. You want us there, Absolutely. We'll together, Absolutely. Tell us, what, tell us what you want, who you want, how you want to frame it. We will come. Thank you, thank you. And I one, one day of my fall syllabus in down. high school. <laughs> I talk to high school students. Yes. You know, so uh, that's the pipeline. I, mean, I talk to all pipeline students, but it's it's not just uh, solely to uh, to um, law students because well, it has to start somewhere. Yes. On on that note, I cannot thank the four of you enough. Alifair, Renee, Blanche, Audrey. It's been amazing. Um, Shana Kay, should I turn it over to you or should I just close it? You can close it. You can close it. I just R want, I do want to say uh, thank you to all of you. This was an amazing conversation. I just amazing, but Ben and I turn it over to you. And Shana Kay, just before Professor, I, I, I want to really say that I appreciate um, the uh, honor and the gratitude uh, regarding Black people and, and building New York City uh, and, and, and Indigenous people. I, I really appreciated that acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, on that note, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I thank the audience for joining us. And um, that's it. Bye, everybody. Bye.